A seismograph is a sensitive enough accelerometer to measure tiny vibrations in the earth. The early mechanical versions before the use of electronics work like this, where a weight being held by a pendulum remains stationary as the ground beneath the weight with the pen attached would move back and forth, moving the paper with it, so the pen stays still while the paper moves, making the mark on itself. The seismograph by itself can't find where earthquakes start or its epicenter, since all they do is just record when the waves hit the instrument. The seismograph first records a smaller wave called a P wave, which is well named because the P is the primary, or first. It's always the first one. Then the second larger wave is called the S wave, also well named because it's second. The S waves are slower because they are transverse waves, or waves that travel in the direction perpendicular to their waveform. Since they oscillate sideways to the path of propagation, this makes a slower moving wave. The P waves are faster because being longitudinal, they oscillate in the direction that they're headed. So with no wasted movement, these waves arrive first at the seismograph. Here you can see that the green P wave beats the red S wave from an earthquake focus. And the further they move through the earth, the more the P wave separates from the S wave. Scientists can use the difference in their separation, or lag time, on a graph like this one on the right side of the page to find out how far away is the earthquake starting point, or epicenter. The more time separating the smaller P wave and the larger S wave on the seismogram, the further away is the epicenter. That means we can derive the distance from the time lag on this time versus distance graph. Also notice that the S wave can't move through the liquid mantle, while the P wave, being a compressional wave, can. Triangulation of an epicenter happens this way. On this map, we have three different seismic stations, Salt Lake City, Houston, and Savannah. Each one detects the same earthquake at different times, because it takes longer for the seismic waves to reach the seismographs further away. For Salt Lake City, it takes one minute for the P wave to reach their seismograph, and four minutes for the S wave. So that means we have recorded a three minute time lag between the arrival of the P and S waves. Now we look on the time versus distance graph, and we take the difference in time, three minutes, from the time Y axis. Then we move it until it fits snugly between the pre-plotted S and P lines. Then we look down to the distance axis to read how far away the earthquake started from Salt Lake City. All that we know from this information is how far away the epicenter is from Salt Lake City, not where it is. So that means it could be 1,800 kilometers to the east, or 1,800 kilometers to the west, or north, or any other direction. But since we do know the distance, that means we can draw a circle for all those possible distances around Salt Lake City, 1,800 kilometers wide for where the epicenter must have been. Then we do the same for two more seismographic stations using the same method. We find the distance from Houston to be 800 kilometers and for Savannah, 1300 kilometers. If we did it right, the three circles we draw should pretty closely intersect at a point. So boom, there it is. Now, do you see why we call it triangulation? We need a minimum of three stations to get an intersection for an accurate location. Two can get us in a general direction, like north or east, but it takes three to get a fairly accurate location. But in real life, when scientists want a location, they aren't going to settle for the intersection of just three circles. The more data, the better. Now this is how you do the Geology Lab's online assignment. You'll need to approximate an epicenter for San Francisco area, and to help you with doing that, I'll take you through one in Mexico. So I'm clicking on the Mexico button. You'll click on the San Francisco button. It takes you to another page like this one, where you click on View Seismograms. For Chihuahua, you look at where the line starts to jiggle, reading it from left to right, just like reading a book. They've made it easy for you, giving a starting point of zero on each seismogram. In reality, these occur along a 24-hour timeline. Look at the time at the bottom of the graph and find where the first jiggle starts on the left, that's the P wave, and where the second jiggle starts to the right of the other one is the S wave. 
you will type in the S minus P interval box how much time you see between the two jiggles. I call this the time lag. I read this one as 0 to 65 seconds, so I type that in. And you do this for the two other seismograms, Mazatlan 44 and Rosarito 55. Then you click on the Convert S minus P interval button. Now you're on this page with the time lag graphs. So, since Chihuahua has 65 seconds for a time lag, you can just use their line labeled S minus P, go up to 65 seconds, and out to where the line crosses that time, and look down on the X axis for the distance. I get 640 kilometers for Chihuahua's distance to the epicenter. Now, I look on the graph for Mazatlan's 44 second time lag. Again, I move up the graph to 44 seconds and across to the S minus P line and find a distance of 420 kilometers. And for Rosarito, I go 55 seconds up the graph and over to where it looks like 550 kilometer distance. Now I click on the button for find epicenter and I check the map they plotted with three circles. Each one is a different color and represents that distance you got for each seismic station. Where they intersect may not be a clean point. I tried this several times for each one of these and it always tells me, oops, the three circles don't intersect. Like I'm a loser and I can't do this. Actually, you're awesome if you get it this close. I got somewhere near La Paz, which is great for the Mexico quake. They won't all cross cleanly on a point for you, so don't worry about that. Also, don't worry about the message at the bottom that says you should try again to find your mistake. But if your three circles don't come close somewhere, then you know you need to go back and try again. Finally, for this assignment, you need to upload a picture of your triangulated epicenter along with the closest city to indicate that you found it. Ah!